stakeholders are increasingly demanding more action by corporations and their management teams around climate risk issues. Stakeholders in this context refer to investors, which taken more holistically includes firms that allocate capital more generally. So underwriters of public debt and equity instruments like investment banks, purchasers of those securities like asset managers or hedge funds, and direct balance sheet lenders like commercial banks. And then we have customers, employees, suppliers, members of local communities, local nonprofits, and local government, and finally, regulators. Let's discuss the unique expectations of these stakeholder groups around engagement on climate risk issues. Investors and other capital providers are demanding greater transparency, data quality, and tangible action plans around how a company's management team will both decarbonize its operations and reduce its risk exposure to climate change. Given the financial implications, investors want to know how their money will be protected from the range of risks that climate change presents. Operators that aren't on top of this evolution may find that accessing capital is more difficult, more expensive, or both. On the flip side, the market for decarbonization and climate-related products and services is projected to be in the trillions, which itself creates significant opportunity over the long run. Indeed, many investment funds have emerged that are specifically focused in this area. Customers, both individual consumers and B2B buyers, reserve the right to do business with companies that they are aligned with on values, including environmental and social issues. So, management teams without a strong reputation or verified ESG performance risk watching their customers vote with their wallets. Another important business case for improved ESG maturity is that B2B customers in particular are increasingly facing stakeholder pressures to reduce their own scope three emissions, meaning that supply chain partners with a plan and a strong RFP response, complete with emission information and other ESG data, of course, make for an easier procurement process. This is all the more true for publicly traded companies facing climate risk disclosure regulations across major global markets. These regulatory requirements are trickling down to the suppliers that work with them, making climate and ESG performance a key part of everyone's procurement process. In fact, the largest buyer of products and services in the world, the United States government, has implemented policies around federal supplier climate risk and emissions disclosures. Employees have the potential to be a firm's biggest fans or its harshest critics. Employees, especially younger ones, increasingly have core expectations of their employers. One is that if leadership makes a commitment publicly, they ought to act on it. This is sometimes referred to as a corporation's say-do ratio. When a corporation's say-do ratio is noticeably misaligned, meaning they are making public commitments without any swift or tangible action, that's when whistleblowing, walkouts, and mass resignations may emerge as both a reputational and an operational risk. With millennials expected to make up approximately 75% of the workforce by 2025, these internal expectations are only expected to continue rising. Suppliers are increasingly looking to their corporate buyers to provide guidance, support, and resources in order to help them meet these new expectations on climate performance and disclosure too. Given the fact that corporate supply chains comprise the majority of a company's emissions footprint, 
ESG performance will become an increasingly critical part of securing or retaining buyer contracts. Suppliers are expecting not only direct support in meeting these expectations, but also long-term partnership if they make a commitment to work collaboratively. At this point, we'd like to introduce an example code of conduct. You can download the attachment below the video player. Feel free to pause the video here and take some time to read it. This document is positioned as a partner code of conduct, but is highly relevant to suppliers too. In this case, partners may include contractors or other service providers, as well as joint venture partners or other capital providers. The language is sufficiently generic that members of the CFI community are encouraged to leverage and repurpose it in ways that can support the specific needs of their firms. From a high level, you'll see it's been broken into six sections. ESG alignment, human rights, safety, and workforce standards, product and service safety, quality, and compliance, verification, including the right to audit and take corrective action, metrics and reporting, and policy governance. Categories and specific callouts within each can be customized by need, but you'll note that these six topics address many of the core tenets of the ESNG framework. The main idea behind a code of conduct like this is to ensure alignment with key partners and suppliers on the issues that matter most to a company's management team. Local communities, nonprofits, and municipalities expect corporate engagement on local issues, such as climate change and adaptation. And they want high levels of transparency and explicit accountability measures with respect to commitments made by management teams. Working collaboratively with communities in order to meet these expectations helps a business secure their local license to operate, which can go a long way in minimizing third-party opposition at the community level. Co-benefits like local job creation, environmental conservation, and local procurement all present ways to proactively meet these expectations in a tangible and meaningful way. And finally, shifts in the global regulatory environment are also putting significant pressure on companies to publicly disclose climate risk management practices and any associated ESG performance metrics. Many of the world's major markets, including the United States, the European Union, China, the United Kingdom, Singapore, as well as the rest of the G7, including Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, have all implemented or are in the process of implementing climate risk disclosure regulations. Many developing markets are also facing pressure to implement climate risk disclosure regulations, a notable example of which is the Nairobi Stock Exchange in Kenya. As noted previously, the two most pressing climate issues facing both operating companies and financial services firms are the following. One, how to reduce contributions to climate change, and two, how to reduce risk exposure from climate change. A net zero economy requires changes in strategies and operating models, but management teams and funds still face pressures to grow and remain profitable while doing so. It's not an easy feat, but it's the reality that companies are operating in. Pressures around specific commitment levels like expectations for net zero emissions or adhering to a science-based target, will also require that any and all claims be backed up by auditable, transparent, and traceable data. This can put enormous pressure 
on an organization's governance function. The implications of not meeting these expectations can be significant, both within the court of public opinion, but also financially. Entities that do not demonstrate tangible action in meeting these overarching pressures will increasingly feel the operational, reputational, and strategic strains of continuing business as usual against the backdrop of fast formalizing regulations and evolving stakeholder expectations. Customer losses, employee attrition, costlier capital, and brand cancellation are just a few of the potential ramifications. The bottom line is this. Companies can either be dragged along to address their contributions to and risk exposure from climate change, or they can proactively begin the transition process, potentially tapping more customers, more enthusiastic brand advocates, and more flexible and reliable sources of funding along the way.